Kurt is a Grammy um, a winner. He's won actually seven Grammys. Seven Grammys. Oh, more? Nine? Nine Grammys. It ain't bragging if it's true, right? It's a nine Grammys. Uh, he is a host of, of multiple TV shows. He's a songwriter, really an advocate. He, he honestly is a civil rights uh, activist in the fact that God has used him greatly to be able to connect the church from all different walks. And, um, and he's really, more than anything else, a church member that sits under uh, the teachings of um, Tony Evans on a week-to-week -week basis. And uh, we just love the fact that, that he is available to Today, uh, to just not do what his day job is, which is to typically do what he's going to do tonight, but to do this other thing where he's just going to get up this morning, open up the Word of God, and, and preach to us. And so, uh, can we just welcome to Liberty University the great Kirk Franklin. Come on, spread the love for him. Man, you know that uh, that this uh, man, you know that this flesh is such a monster, man. Because you know um, when he said seven, it's like my flesh. Like you better tell him nine, you know, because you know the, the flesh is always wanting to be praised and and uh, you know pumped up, but I want to let you know that I pray that none of that crap matters when I stand before you because there won't be a Grammy line in heaven and there won't be a, a dove line in heaven. It'll just be my kids and I just want to be part of the family and I just want to be able to stand so I can hear God say, well done, not how many Grammys did you win. So it won't matter. Now, you have already, you've already made me feel at home um, because you put the podium low <laughs> and you blessed me with a gift. Where's the bass player? Come here. Yeah. This is such a blessing to me <laughs> that y'all found a little man child my height. God bless you. Lord, bless the word today. Let it be pleasing to you. Let us bring you glory. It's not about me. It's about you. I decrease. Father, I ask that you forgive me for all my sins and iniquity so I may be able to rep you and to be able to just spit the word the way you want me to. I decrease as you increase. In the name of the King, I pray. Amen. Amen. So, I have a son who was running track and... And um, he was on the four by 100 relay. Now, if you know anything about track, you know that one of the most beautiful things about track is the relay. The relay is beautiful because it's about these four runners running at the same time. And the most beautiful part about the relay is what? It's about the handoff, right? <laughs> Now, now, when you, <laughs> calm down, calm down, calm down. <laughs> now, when you get the handoff right, it can be a beautiful, beautiful picture because you've got these four runners that can't break their speed and they can't break their pace and they've got to be able to take the baton and they have to be able to pass it to the next runner without slowing down. Somebody say baton. Now, the beautiful thing is that when you get this thing down right, it can be a beautiful, beautiful picture of these runners and they're passing the baton to each other. Now, the difference between the 4 by 400 and the 4 by 100 is that the 4 by 400, you have one runner running on the track by himself. Now, the 4 by the 4 by 100, the 4 by 100 is the relay. It's with all four runners on the track at the same time. My son was part of the four by 100 relay. 
Now, the track meet started. Me and other fathers got there early because we knew our boys were looking good that day. My son was there. The other three sons were there. Me and other dads were up in the stands looking pretty good. And we even looked at the competition that day, and it looked like we were going to have a pretty good race. Some of the boys looked like they could have a good sandwich. They looked a little skinny, looked a little hungry. And so we looked like we were going to have a good race that day. Now, my son, being a Franklin, he was running fourth leg. You know, he was running the end. So that means that he was going to be the guy that got them back into the race at the very end. Now, the first runner has the baton. He gets up to the starting line. It's time for him and other runners to get ready. Now, the guy with the gun gets ready to shoot the gun. Bam! Goes off. The first runner on my son's team has a very good pace, running good. I mean, he's killing it, y'all. Running, killing all the other boys. Looks so good, I went and got popcorn. I got popcorn for me and other fathers, because this looked like this was going to be a race that was going to be an easy race. Now, now, remember, the 4x100 relay, you're running by yourself when you're on the team. And remember, it's all about, it's all about the handoff. So he gets around to the last curve, and it's time what? For the passing of the baton. And remember, the passing of the baton is go, stick. Beautiful. When you get it right, it's beautiful. Now, first guy still kept the lead. The lead was going good. Gets around the last curve, and it's time for the second runner. Second runner's getting ready. Turns. Go, stick. Grabs the baton. He continues the lead. Beautiful, right? Chilling. Other fathers are chilling. We got our feet up. It's looking good. We, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of sticking our tongue out at the other daddies, you know. You know, we're making fun of them. This fool, <laughs> when he gets to the second curve, drops the baton. Yeah, that's what we did. Ah. That's what the other teammates did. Ah. That's what the fathers did. Ah. Some of the fathers said other things, but it's a Christian school, so you know. <laughs> he drops the baton. Now, what even made it worse is that, uh, you know, the, the, that morning before, you know, it, there was rain, and so it was a little rainy. So he drops the baton. Now he drops it on a wet track, and it's got a little grain on it, so he picks it up. It's wet, it's dirty, and now it's late. It's a drop baton that's a now a late baton. And guess what has to happen? The next runner has to run harder just to get back in the race. Because this fool didn't outrun his race well. He got too comfortable in the lead and forgot that it was a relay. David, King David, forgot that his life was part of a relay. He's in battle, he's winning the battle, and he stays at home, and instead of being in wartime, he stays at the crib, gets on the balcony, chills with his toms on, <laughs> sitting back drinking Pellegrino, should have been in battle, married man, daddy, looks across the street to the other balcony, and he sees Beyonce. <laughs> That's not what the text says. That's not what it says. Don't say Beyonce. Don't say that. Ah, Bathsheba. <laughs> Beyonce, Bathsheba. <laughs> and instead of being focused with the baton, forgets that it's not about him, and sleeps with another man's woman and drops the baton. Now his children, his sons, Amnon, Absalom, they begin to drop the baton because their father forgot his focus and his purpose in life, and now we see the curse of his whole family in God's Word because this brother forgot that he was running a race that was a relay. My father dropped the baton. I was adopted at the age of four by a 64-year-old woman. She was a widow, had no money, social security check, government cheese, 
food stamps, standing in line. She recycled newspapers and beer cans to pay for my piano lessons. Fourth grade education, I got in trouble when I was a kid, messed up, 17, got a young lady pregnant, dropped out of school, I was homeless for over a year, and my father was not in my life, and so I had to run harder just to get back in the race. My sister was incarcerated for 12 years, drug addiction, stealing, prostitution, so our whole family has suffered, and we did suffer, until I realized that the baton given to me cannot continue to be dropped on my sons and my daughters and my family. I had to realize that now God has given me the opportunity to make up for what I lost. But guess what? Some of you here, you've had to run with a dropped, dirty, contaminated baton. Some of you, you look good, you look pretty, you look fly, but we don't know what you've gone through. We don't know how hard some of you've had to run. We don't know what some of the pain that you've had to go through because somebody in your life, somebody at your church, some pastor, some youth leader dropped the baton, they gave you a dirty baton, and you've had to run with a lot of pain. We don't know what you've gone through, but I do know that if you're here today, if you've got the baton, it is very important for you to realize that it is necessary for you to real, realize that you cannot continue to make the same mistakes of those that came before you, because we need you to realize it is a powerful opportunity to start all over again. Now, the only way you can do that is to remember the lessons from those that have made mistakes. Now, here's some of the things I realize about people that continue to drop the baton and make mistakes in your generation. It's first of all, they forget. They forget that it is a relay and it's not a sprint. See, the sprint, you're by yourself. The glory goes to you. You know. You know. <laughs> you know, it's about you. It's about your glory. It's about your Grammys. It's about your stuff. It's about how much we can praise you. It's about you being on the worship team, but you sing a little bit louder on the worship team so we can hear you. And you sound just like that. <laughs> and you don't sing part of the crew. You don't sing part of the choir. You're always looking for the solo. But in the kingdom, we need for you to realize that if you're the only one shining, you have forgotten that the kingdom is not about your flaws. It's not about your bling. It's not about how fresh you are. It's about the body being as strong as you. And if the body is not as strong as you, we've all lost, baby. We've all lost. Those are my black friends. Those are my black friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so funny. <laughs> but tell the beautiful person next to you, it's not about you. It's about us. That's what the kingdom, that's what the race is about. It's about not how strong I am, but how strong we are. And me realizing that if I drop it, I make you run harder. When a preacher drops a baton, the whole church suffers. When the father drops a baton, the whole house suffers. Too many families, too many ministries have died. And when people hear about God, they remember the dude that dropped the baton. But I believe that there are some kings and queens up in here that realize that God has called you for a greater race and that the goal cannot be for you, but it's got to be for the body. Say amen. Yeah. Here's the next thing that I learned about the reason why we keep dropping the batons is because we practice more than we compete. See, the problem with this subculture of churches that bubble that we all get stuck in and we get out into the world and we don't know what's going on in the world. We don't know what they're talking about. We don't know the culture. We don't know the swag. We don't know the fashion. We don't know the conversation. We don't know how to present Christ and a fresh culture because we spend so much time in this bubble. And when the bubble pops, you have no idea where you're going. So we can practice all we want to, but we've got to be able to not be afraid to get out there and compete. 
And when the competition comes, we got to know that you've been working on your skills. We got to realize that you've been studying the game film. Because let me tell you what the enemy does. Let me tell you what the enemy does. The enemy knows your game film. He studies your game film. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what you like. He knows you like them light skin. He knows you like them tall, six foot seven. He knows you like them with the blue eyes and the nice eyes. He knows your game film, boo boo. He knows what you do. He knows that you wanted to be a certain way, a certain look. And he's going to not, he's not going to bring the stuff to you that you don't like. He's going to bring to you what you do like. So you got to be prepared to know that you have to be alert and aware because you are too valuable in the war. Now, when you practice, you got to allow God to put you in positions where you know that what you studied is really going to be effective. You don't want a car that has a, 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 a seatbelt and airbag, and when you get into a wreck, it doesn't work. So what they do is they put dummies. <laughs> they put dummies in the car to make sure that when there's a wreck, that the airbag works. And sometimes us dummies have to be willing to get in the car and make sure that the Bible that we read and pray and the God that we trust, he really works in real time. I had that opportunity several years ago. Now, one thing that I don't like is I do, I struggle a lot with pride. It comes from my own insecurities as a kid, not being told I was ever good, and not being ever told I would ever be anything. You know, mama never told me I'd never be nothing, never really heard it. But I said, Kirk, you're going to be something. I always heard about how bad I was, got in trouble in school. So, you know, I've, I've struggled with a lot of my own personal insecurities. And one thing that I've always seen about myself that I don't like is I don't like the Kirk that I see when I go to award shows. I hate the Kirk. I see at award shows because if I win an award and then you know I see the false humility oh it's not me it's Christ hallelujah it's not me it's about Jesus thank you Jesus I, bye, 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 bye. you know <laughs> but then when I lose I say man I'm not good enough man what happened to me man I went on my game so it's like I don't like the, 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 the um, you know the, the, the bipolar Christianity that I kind of go to when I go through the worship but one award show I went to it was American Music Awards and I went there, and I got there, and I wanted to show up late because I don't really like going because I know my pride doesn't like it because I know most, most of the mainstream people may not really know who I am. So it's like if I go to the Devil Wars, I'm cool because, you know, I'm chilling with Toby and everybody. I'm like, oh, it's my boy. What's up, boy? You know, but at the American Music Awards, it's like I know that my flesh won't be as on 10 because I didn't have the opportunity. Well, the American Music Awards, I got there late hoping I was going to miss was called the red carpet. Now, you've seen it on TV, this red carpet. It's all about the red carpet crew. The red carpet goes from the back to where the sign is, Liberty, all the way to the very back up here, and it's a long carpet, and on one side of the carpet is what they call paparazzi. And the paparazzi's there, and they're there waiting for the big stars. Now, my car pulled up, and I was trying to sneak out and not really be, you know, we were, because I knew wasn't nobody going to really know who I was. And I was like, many people don't know me. They're waiting for the big, big-time stars. And again, my flesh didn't want to be embarrassed. So I snuck out, and as soon as I snuck out, I ran into, believe it or not, Beyonce. <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on. Okay. All right, I'm back. Um, now, she's from Houston, so it's like, you know, okay, how you doing? You know, how's Tammy? How's everybody doing? You know, we're doing good. And now, she was on her way to the holding tent. The holding tent is where they hold you before it's time to go out to the red carpet. Now, I found myself stuck in between Beyonce and another group that was making their debut after like a 20-year hiatus, a group called Duran Duran. Yeah, yeah. So you got Duran Duran, their whole entourage, Beyonce, her whole entourage, and me. <laughs> now, it's me and a publicist, but Duran Duran's got 50 people with them. Beyonce, you know, they got, I mean, Beyonce's got somebody carrying her hair. You know, it's just, you know. <laughs> so, so, and the guy says, now, you guys wait up under the tent. When I tell you to go, turn to your right, because the paparazzi is going to take pictures of you. You ready? Now, some of you, when you get a chance, rent a movie. There's an old movie called Harlem Nights, okay? And then this movie, once again, the black people. Now, 
<laughs> and Harlem Nights, there's a scene in Harlem Nights where Eddie Murphy is being chased by some thugs that have guns. And Eddie Murphy has a big gun. These thugs have really big guns. But the thugs have one guy on their crew that has a little bitty gun. It's like a little bit, you know, kind of like the kind of gun like your grandmama has, you know, like the little bitty, you know, pow, 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 pow. So, she has a, so, so one guy has a little bitty gun with all these big guns. So just keep that in your mind. So the guy says, okay, you ready? When I call your name and I tell you to go, leave from under the tent, turn to your right, that's a paparazzi. So we go out. He says, you ready? Remember, Duran Duran, Beyonce, me. He says, go. And so we go out, and the purple person, Duran, Duran, pow, 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 pow. And they say, Beyonce, oh, Beyonce, pow, 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 pow. And my publisher says, hey, we got Kurt Franklin. And then the purple person said, pop. Pop? Oh, Duran, Duran, pow, 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 pow. Beyonce, and Beyonce's giving it to him, right? She's... <laughs> giving it to him, giving it to him, giving it to him. And my publisher gets mentioned, and we've got Kurt Franklin. And somebody said, pop. And it was like with a camera phone, you know. <laughs> and then my pride, I said, man, I'm not going to take this. I'm not, I'm not taking this. And so what I did is I was getting ready to leave them and just go to my seat. I'm like, man, I'm not going to go the whole way being treated like this. Don't they know who I am? And so it's time for me to leave. And so I'm getting ready to go behind them. And y'all, I promise you, I promise you, I could hear God speak to my heart. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, no, I want you to stay right here. And I want you to go the whole way like this. Because I want you to feel how it feels to be me in the world. I want you to feel the rejection that I feel every day. I wake people up and they don't ask for my autograph. I protect them from trouble. They don't want me to sign the hearts. I cover them and keep them, but nobody acknowledges me. If you want to rock with me, I want you to go the whole way like this and feel how it feels to be connected to me in the real way. Now, what if I would have said, man, no, I don't have time for that. Guess what I would have done? I would have missed a great opportunity to be deeply connected in my faith to the king. But how many times have we missed deeper opportunities to be closer to God because it was not convenient, because it was embarrassing, because it was not comfortable? I'm saying to you, listen to me, soldiers, do not reject moments that God is giving you that are uncomfortable to take you deeper, to feel even more deeply connected as Paul says, I want to know him and the glories of his resurrection, but also in the suffering. I want to not know the God that's just the Santa Claus God that tried to give me everything I want, but I want to know the God that people reject and they laugh and they talk about it. and do not miss those opportunities because you will miss opportunities to grow. Say amen. Last one, last one quickly, is another thing that I noticed about these bad batons that kept getting dropped in, in these meets is because of bad coaching. Guess what I realized that my son's team did not have? My son's track team did not have a track. How, how, how you gonna be a track team and not have a track. It is the coach's responsibility to make sure that his team, if they're going to be competing on a high level, they got to have a track. How many of you have suffered because of bad coaching, bad pastoring, bad teaching, bad leadership, and you find yourself not prepared to defend your faith, to even know why you believe what you believe, to understand the truth about what you believe, because you just got just the cute, you know, crispy, cuddly, you know, you know, uh, 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 snuggly Jesus. You remember the snugglies? Those ugly robe things with the arms in them? 
the Snuggies, and we want that Snuggie, and we sit up under people that give us that Snuggie Jesus, that Snuggle theology. But when the storm comes and when trouble comes, you need something that will hold you, that will keep you, that will make you strong, and you got to have some type of teaching that will tell you about yourself. And guess what? All news can't just be good news. You got to be able to receive the stuff that's going to make you grow. You don't go to a gym and just have the trainer tell you all the good stuff and let you eat whatever you want to eat. Train however you want to train. If you don't sweat, you're not developing any procedures that are necessary for the physical development that you're requesting. And you got to be able to want it, and it won't come easy. It won't come easy. It won't be easy. So back to the track meet, my son's team is now behind. They've dropped the baton, they've lost their lead. And so I'm looking at my son because he's running last leg. And I'm looking at him because I want to see how he's going to respond. And my son starts to do this. I'm watching and my son starts to. What is he doing? He's repositioning himself to get back in the race. Now, I was watching him because his response was going to show me what type of coach I've been. Was he going to walk off and be ticked off? Or was he going to stay and reposition himself to get back in the race? Listen to me, man. Some of you, you're the first in your family to go to school. You're the first in your family to do this. You're the first in your family to do that. You're the first in your family to not leave high school and not be pregnant. You're the first to do this, first to do that. And the reason why I'm letting you know is because the coach always saves his best, fastest runner for last. Watch it, watch it. What happens in practice? What happens in practice? The coach takes a stopwatch and he lets them run hundreds, right? He, what he'll do, he'll, he'll have you run hundreds. Because what he's doing, he's looking for his fastest runner. Why is he looking for his fastest runner? He's going to put his fastest runner last. He's putting his fastest runner last because he wants to make sure that just in case somebody drops the baton, that somebody fast enough to get them back in the race. There's no, re there's no coincidence that you were born when you were born, where you were born, the reason why you were born, the reason why you're here is because the coach was looking at your time. He was looking at the ability that you had, and he knew that you were able to get your family, your generation back in the race because the race isn't given to the swift, the strong but it's to that one who endures until the end. And that's you. That's you. That's you. Don't you realize that you are the one that was destined to be here to get back in the race for all of those that dropped it, for everybody that messed up. You have the opportunity to make it better. But you got to get on the track and you got to follow the instructions of the director. You cannot get out there and run for yourself. You've got to run for your team. You got to follow the instructions of the director. In closing, one of my favorite Michael Jackson videos was Billie Jean. Now, y'all are too young to know what I'm talking about. Do y'all remember the Billie Jean video? Yeah. It's a dope video, dope video. That's when Michael is walking on the steps. Now, the director of the Billie Jean video did a documentary after Michael died, and he said that because Michael was so talented, before we shot the Billie Jean video, remember the Billie Jean videos where the steps would, he would step on each step and they would light up, right? He stepped on a step, it would light up. <laughs> Do you remember the video? The director told Michael, he said, Michael, before we shoot the, this video, it's I need for you to know that what I did is before you showed up to the set, I went in and I pre-lit all of your steps. But now you cannot get out there, Michael, and start doing your own thing. You can't just get out there and, you know, just do whatever you want to, you know. You got to follow what I tell you to do, all right? Because what I did, because if you step in the wrong step, it's not going to light up. But if you step everywhere, I'm telling you now before you get there, if you step on it, I'm telling you it's going to light up because I pre-lit it while you were still asleep. While you were still sleeping at home with the monkey, I already pre-lit everything for you. 
All right? Michael said, okay. <laughs> so Michael shows up to the video, shows up with those white socks, with those glittery socks, with the glitter gloves, with the bad jerry curl that didn't really curl well, with the baby hair. And he shows up, the music starts. <laughs> and so he starts, and Michael remembers what the director said. Michael, step on every step that I tell you to step on because I pre-lit it. So Michael steps, bam, and what happens? It lights up. And Michael goes, hey, it lit up. <laughs> it takes another step, bam, and it lights up because he followed the instructions of the director because the director went in before the video started and pre-lit his steps. While you were in your mother's womb, God says, before you got here, I pre-lit your steps. And all you got to do is follow my instructions, God says, and every step you take will light up. But you can't get out there doing your own thing. You got to follow my instructions because I know where I'm taking you. And I know where I'm going. Even the steps that light up, that look bad, they light up because they're part of the story. Oh, man. Because he's got a story, and it's your story. And guess what? Nobody else can show up to that video shoot. That was Michael's shoot. Nobody can step on the step and light up for them because they were lit only for Michael. Nobody can take your place. Nobody can move you out of the way. Nobody can destroy what God has for you because it's your shoot. And they're your steps. And they were lit before you got here. But you can't run better. You can't run bitter. If my son was bitter and walked up that stay off that field, he would have got a did not qualify or did not finish. He had to run the race. He couldn't just walk off. And some of you may be here running bitter. For a long time, I ran bitter. I ran bitter, man, not knowing who you are, not knowing where you come from and not being identified with your blood. I ran many years bitter, wrote a lot of songs bitter, lived life bitter, went to church bitter and not better. Some of you, maybe you need to forgive some people that passed you that dirty baton because you've had to run harder and you're mad at them because you had to. Quickly, if that's you, and if you want to, only if you want to, if you want to come down and maybe just kneel here and we'll make it an altar and you want to just forgive and forget and let go of some of the people that you've been running bitter with, come and we'll kneel together. Because you can't run bitter, it's too important of a race for you to keep running mad and angry. Come, 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 come. If you've been running bitter, you've been worshiping bitter, you've been shouting bitter, you've been praying bitter, come, come, and we'll make this a moment for you and the King, not for my glory so that you can run your race well, so that we can hear God say to you, well done, and you can run fast, and you can accomplish. Come, come, come. As uncomfortable as it is, that means you need to come. Because true leadership, true greatness is never comfortable. It's always inconvenient, it's always difficult. Greatness will always pull out the difficulty in you. This is not convenient Christianity. This is not selfish stewardship. This is about I present myself a living sacrifice. And I got to get out of the way so you can do great things in me. And I got to forgive. I got to forgive them. I got to forgive me. I got to forgive me. I got to forgive. I got to forgive. Or if you've been running bored, if you're tired, if you're on E, and if you're like, God, I want to run faster, but I'm tired, I'm bored, I'm frustrated. If that's you, you come too. Whatever it is that's standing in the way of you running the race that God has called you to run, come, come. 
It's your choice. It's up to you. We'll be cool. We'll wait. We don't mind. And Jesus loves you so much. He loves you so much. Those of you sitting, please pray with us. Just in your eyes closed and your heart open, just pray with us. As people come, just pray. Father, while I'm praying, keep coming. Father, you want truth and you want honesty. You don't want to show. You want my dirt, my luggage, my junk, my rocks, the ugly stuff. I'm coming and I'm bringing it because it's slowing me down. It's like I'm running with boots on and I'm not free like I want to be. I want to be free, God. I don't want to run with all this crap in my life and my mind because I'm not running the race I know you want me to run. And God, I know I got to forgive some people and I'm telling you right now, God, it ain't easy. It ain't easy to forgive because I'm so mad and I'm waiting for them to say they're sorry. And I've been waiting for years to hear the word I'm sorry and they're not giving it to me. They're not giving me what I want to hear. I want to hear I'm sorry. I screwed you up. I messed over you. And they're not doing it. And so I'm running, but I'm mad. I'm worshiping, but I'm mad. I'm not whole. So Father, right now, I'm asking you for power that I don't have to release them. Give me what I don't humanly have, the ability to release. The ability to forgive, not just with my words, but God, deep in my soul. I want to forgive, and I want to let them go. And I want to forgive them even though they're not saying the word, I'm sorry. So that I can be what you want me to be. So I can fulfill what you want me to fulfill because I'm slowing down and I'm not running the way I know I need to be running. And I'm sorry, God, because I want to run faster. I, I know you're calling me for greater things, but I can't get these rocks out of my shoes. I can't get this weight off my shoulder so I can be faster and freer. Please. So today I come. The best I know how I come. With what I have, I come. And only by faith, not by emotions, but by faith, because faith is the only thing you respond to, by faith. Not just me doing the acrobats of, of Christianity, but by faith, I give myself away. It's yours. I surrender. And I give you thanks. In everything, I give thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you've come down for prayer, uh, I want our campus pastors, some of our RDs, some of our leadership, if you would make yourself available. Just so we want to make sure that everyone's being prayed with and prayed for and uh, just ministered to. Can we just thank our brother, Kirk, for uh, pastoring today and shepherding today. Brother, we love you. Looking forward to tonight. Man. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, let's do this just as a last thing. Let's lay our hands towards uh, just those folks who've come today. Can we just put our hands towards them and uh, just look over to them? Would you just with your eyes on them, would you just look down at, at those people who've come today? I really believe that today God is healing people. I, what a timely thing, Kurt, for you to say. People are waiting to hear, I'm sorry, and, and today they've just got to trust that Jesus saying, I'm here, is more powerful than I'm sorry. That I've forgiven them is more powerful than you've got to forgive them. And some of you have been hurt by people, and that's why you hurt people. And, and today God wants to deliver you from, from just walking around with two tracks, the love of God and the hate of maybe a father who left you, gave you broken promises, maybe someone who who did something that's really scarred your life. And the 
grace of God is more than enough just to save you. He can also heal you. The grace of God is more than enough for just salvation. It's even today for sanctification. Amen? So let's just put our hands towards our brothers and our sisters. Just pray for them. Father, we pray that even today that they would receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that they would receive God a supernatural ability to forgive. God, that people would begin even now to breathe easy knowing that, um, that God, they don't need to hear I'm sorry from another person when they hear that the gospel is more than enough to let them even forgive those who have hurt them. That the gospel is so much greater than just for salvation. That the gospel right now is greater than that, the moment where they get to go to heaven. That the gospel can give them a, a piece of heaven now, a piece of that healing now. Thank you, Lord, that they're going to walk out of here knowing that they have received from you what maybe even man was not able to give today. Lord, I pray that, that in this very moment that they would know that, God, that by your stripes, by your wounds, that they can find today just great comfort for every situation of life. Amen? Amen. Hey, if you want to continue to be prayed for, stick around if you would. Our pastors are going to come on other people. The rest of you, we love you. Again, CFO folks, we're glad you're with us this weekend. See you tonight at the Kirk Franklin concert, okay? God bless you guys. Thank you.